Well, thank you all so much for coming here today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of what I do um, as a, an international attorney. A lot of my work is in the human rights uh, field, and I try to incorporate technology where I can with certain cases. When I first came to Afghanistan, um, I was sent there in 2008, and I was sent there for a capacity building program. Um, one of my clients that I represented very recently is a young girl named Jade from Vienna. Jade was a 21-year-old girl. She was going to school. She was working. She had a boyfriend. Her family wasn't super happy about her having a boyfriend, but uh, they accepted it to a certain extent. Once the boyfriend asked for a hand in marriage, her family accepted it, but only with the caveat that if Jade agreed to go with the mother back to Afghanistan, their homeland, to get the permission of her grandmother for his hand in marriage, then they would accept the marriage. So Jade was super excited and she packed and she went to travel to Afghanistan with her mother and her baby sister. And when they got there, they were met at the airport with her favorite uncle. And as soon as they get in the car, her uncle asks to look at her passport. He takes her passport, he looks at it, and then he tells Jade that actually she's not going back to Vienna and that next week she's marrying someone else. When I originally came to Afghanistan in 2008, um, it was the first time that I ever left the US. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a mid-sized city um, in America. And it's funny, since I've been in London, I've been asked by so many people, they'll say, you know, you're from America, where's that? And I'll say Wisconsin, and they'll just kind of say, yeah, no one knows where it's at. But basically, Milwaukee is like an hour and a half above Chicago. And so when I went to Afghanistan, it was my first time, like I said, where I needed a passport. And the first thing that I saw getting off the plane was this, were burqas. And for me, um, seeing a burqa for the first time was a very confronting image. It was very sad for me, um, scary, because you don't really know what's under that. And so originally, while I was sent there to capacity build Afghanistan, so I went there as part of this justice-funded program to train and mentor Afghan defense attorneys. Prior to going there, I'd been working in the public defender's office for almost six years, and so I was, a, I was solely a criminal defense attorney. And frankly, me being hard, hired for this job was completely ridiculous. I had zero international experience. I had not taken any international law classes in law school. I didn't even know where Afghanistan was on a map, frankly. And so it was just, I was sort of, you know, jumped in to go to Afghanistan to be this sort of reported expert in the legal system. And I was supposed to train the Afghan lawyers while also building their legal aid program. And so I thought for me, the best way for me to educate myself on the Afghan legal system would be if I went to the prisons and I talked to uh, and meet people and talk to them about their experiences within the court system. So I went to the prisons. And at that point in time, in 2008, no one had ever gone to the prisons before, no foreign lawyers. And so, oddly enough, I was given complete access to prisons in Afghanistan. I went all around the country and I've talked to hundreds, if not thousands of people, just to understand how court was, what happened in court. And basically, my purpose in doing this was to be a better trainer to Afghan defense attorneys. And every single I, per I talked to, not one person really told me how they had a fair trial. I was hearing repeated stories about how people were being tortured. I was hearing repeated stories about how people weren't allowed to speak in court, how they didn't have a defense attorney um, representing them. From this situation, I then decided to go to the trials just to see how law works in action. And so I remember going to a trial at Afghanistan's National Security Court. And this court is a court that's heavily funded by the US and the UK governments. And it's a court where purportedly they're supposed to send terrorists through. I'm sitting in court and I'm very excited. And this is the first time, to my surprise, that a foreign lawyer had ever went to an Afghan court just to sit there and observe. So as I'm sitting there, they open the door and these two police officers come and in the middle of them is a man who's handcuffed with his feet, his legs and his arms and his, his hands and his legs are shackled. 
and he has a bag over his head. He looked more like a hostage than a defendant. The judges said that they wanted court to start, and as soon as court started, one of the police officers ceremoniously ripped the bag off his head, and that's what began court. The prosecutors then were asked to stand up to present their case. And the prosecutor stood up, and he read from a piece of paper, his indictment. And basically in this indictment, he said that this man was a taxi driver and that he was driving in an area that has known terrorist activity. In his cab on that day were four other customers. And to understand how taxis work in Afghanistan, they work like an Uber pool. So people share cabs. You don't really know who's in the cab. And then the prosecutors read in the indictment that they found guns and cell phones in the cab. Everyone in Afghanistan has guns and cell phones. And so based on that, the police officers decided to then arrest the taxi driver, and they charged him with being a terrorist. Now, as I'm sitting there, um, and then he sat down. So I'm sitting there, and I'm sort of just waiting for sort of the next step, you know, which is you bring in police officers, you bring in witnesses, you bring in evidence. But that was it. That was all the evidence that the prosecutors had to give. As soon as the prosecutor was done and he sat down, the judges said to the guy, and he said, do you have anything to say? The first thing this guy said is, I'm a taxi driver. I'm not a terrorist. If I'm a terrorist, bring the man before me that accuses me of this thing, not realizing that he was invoking his right to confrontation. Now, this man didn't have an attorney. He didn't know the law. The judges then said, well, why are you involved in terrorist activities? And he said, I'm not a terrorist. And the judge sort of held up a piece of paper, and he said, you signed this piece of paper. You signed this confession. And the guy, with his hands still shackled, he said, I can't read and write. I don't know what's on that piece of paper. And what they did is he put his thumbprint on the piece of paper. And so the guy said, they, they tortured me, and they made me sign that document. I have no idea what that says. What I later learned after being in Afghanistan for months and months after that is what was commonly happening is that people were being forced to thumbprint fake, um, blank pieces of paper and then confessions were written on these pieces of paper and then that was then used against people. So the guy sort of kept complaining about being tortured and the judges sort of nervously looked at me and, and realized that I was in the room and so one of the judges, he sort of pounded on the table and he said, enough. And he said, don't disrupt me. Don't disrupt me. So anything this guy had to say was done, court was over. Five minutes later, he was found guilty of being a terrorist, given eight years in prison, labeled a terrorist for life. So that case always stuck with me about you know, the, the judge screaming, don't disrupt me. And so based on this experience, and based on my experience of sort of going to the prisons, I decided to quit my job with this capacity building program. And then in 2009, I started taking cases in Afghanistan. And I became the first and only foreigner to litigate in the Afghan courts. Part of my process of what I do there is I knew I needed to fight on behalf of my clients. And, I, and I, what I call that is I'm fighting for justness. And what justness means to me is using the laws for their intended purpose, which is to protect. The role of laws is to protect. And while I've been in Afghanistan since 2000, 2008, I have realized that even though many people in Afghanistan were wholly ignorant to what their laws are, that this is not just a problem in Afghanistan, but this is a problem all over the world. People don't know what their rights are. They don't know what the laws are. They don't know how to access to law. And so as a result of this, justness sort of has become my truth. Now, getting back to Jade. Now, Jade, when she went from the airport, her uncle sort of put her in a house, and she was locked in this room. She had no idea where she was. And so Jade managed to steal a SIM card. And when she did that, she had a cell phone, and she sent me her first text. And so I received this text from her. And she wrote, Kim, are you awake? I lie in my bed and hear the gunshots. They're shooting all around. Don't worry about that, Jade. That has nothing to do with you. Relax. It'll be fine. OK, I'll relax. I'm scared. 
Now, the thing about Jade's situation is that we knew that we had a very limited amount of time to try to find exactly what door this girl is behind. There's no real distinguishable addresses in Afghanistan. Like, for instance, my address is I live in Sherpur, Street 3, Lane 2, three horses down, three houses down, blue door, two houses down from General Dosum's house. That's my address. And so a girl from Austria, Vienna, she has no idea where she's at, and she is, especially when she's locked in the house. But we knew our time was limited because the plan was is that they were going to take Mary Jade in six days now, and then she was going to go to Pakistan, and we definitely would have a much harder time finding her. So the clock was ticking. Now, part of what I do is I try to represent people by using the laws. That's my whole thing. It's using the laws that are within different communities. There was a young girl named Katara. And Katra was a law student um, who was married uh, to a man. And it was actually an arranged marriage by her parents. The man that she married was a police officer, so her parents thought it'd be a good fit because you know she, they knew she wanted to go to law school and she's marrying a police officer. Well, anyway, while she was with her husband, he w became very jealous ab about the fact that she wanted to, to go to school. And she wanted to continue, but he didn't want her to continue. And so he would routinely beat her, and Katra would routinely complain about this to her parents. At one point, Katra went to her mother's house to complain about it, and because she also believed in the system, they then went together to the police to report it. The police didn't take it seriously, what she was saying was happening to her. He was, you know, he was beating her, he was slapping her, he was cutting her. And so they didn't bother to even write it down in a police report. Despite the fact that Katra's mother begged and begged and begged, she said, what do I need to do in order to get you guys to write it down? And the police officer said, come back when she's dead. So two days later, when Katra was at her house, she was on her way out the door because she was going to go to college. And before she left, her husband beat the crap out of her. She ran out the house, and he chased her. And his uncle was there also, and, and he also helped the husband beat Katra. They found her in a field, and then they burned her body. They dragged her back to the house. They put a nail in her forehead, and they killed her. When her body ended up at the coroner's office, she had burns throughout. She had a nail to her forehead. She had cuts throughout her body, and they ruled it to be a suicide. And so Katra's mother came to me um, for the simple fact of wanting to know if there's anything that I could do to help in representing her. Now, up until this point, uh, there is nobody, no victims that were being represented in Afghanistan. There they have a new, uh, they had a new Elimination of Violence Against Women law that's still intact in that allows for victims to be represented in court. And so we talked about possibly me representing the family in court. And in addition to this, because the police officers did not do what they were supposed to do, we also decided to sue the police. And so based on these interventions, we were successful in suing the police for their failure to act. And we were able to make sure that the perpetrators, that they were actually charged with murder and then convicted for murdering Katra, for mur murdering Katra which was huge. It was huge in, in the sense that um, it showed sort of Afghan women and Afghan men that victims have the right to be represented in court. And it also showed people another avenue that they can take other than criminal charges in suing sort of an institution for failing to do their job. So let's get back to Jade. Now on Sunday, Jade sent me another text. The thing about it is, is that we weren't sure when she could text us. And so because she was hiding sort of the SIM card. And so she wrote to me and she said, I think they suspect something. And I wrote back, focus on escaping, but cooperate with them. We're close. OK? OK. So five more days to go, and we knew we needed to do something. Now, the way that my practice works is that it's a private, for-profit, international um, law firm. However, about 30% of my work is pro bono human rights cases. 
And so I consider myself to be a global investor in human rights. I invest in human rights. And I invest in human rights with my time and my efforts to represent people pro bono that are in very vulnerable situations. Some of those people that I represent and that I get involved in their cases um, have involved immigration issues. A couple weeks ago, there is a Uyghur man who was in the Qatar, who was in the Qatar airport um, in Doha. And so basically this man, he was going to be deported back to China by the Qataris. So what he did is he put out a 30 second video asking and begging for the world, world's help. Now the Uyghurs, there's about 12 million Uyghurs that are reported to be in China. And basically the Uyghurs are part of the uh, minority persecuted Muslim class. What's been happening or what's been reported to happening is that the Chinese government has been taking Uyghurs out of their homes or wherever they are and are illegally putting them into this, these camps, these re-education camps as they're calling them. And in these re-education camps, it's been reported that people have been injected with medications. Um, they're sterilizing the men and women, it's been reported. People are losing their memory. They have no idea what the government is putting into their systems. And what often happens is, is that even though we enjoy our technology, what's happening is, is that if police are not seeing Uyghurs with cell phones, where they, they're stopping people indiscriminately and asking to look at their phones. And if they don't give up their phones, then they're detaining them for that. And even if they give up their phones, if they see something on their phones that they think is suspicious, then they detain them for that. There's been sort of indiscriminate laws that have been put into place in different communities in China against the Uyghurs, where they're not even allowed to congregate so many people because they're afraid that they may be, you know, worshiping, um, worshiping, legally sort of practicing their religion. And so this man put out this video while he was at the Doha airport begging for the world's help. And actually, when I got the call on this one, I was watching Lion King with my daughter, which was a good movie. And, you know, it was a Friday, it was a Friday, and we knew or we believed that if he were sent back to China, the chances of him being persecuted were pretty high. And so we were trying to convince governments to take him, to be kind enough to take this man because it's pretty clear, and I think we had a clear argument that he would probably be persecuted based on his religion if he were forced to return to China. And so in addition to it being Friday, the problem is, unfortunately, a lot of countries are just not as kind to refugees as they once were. There's over 70 million people who are displaced persons on this earth right now. Often what I've seen is that people are not trying to run towards something, but they're trying to run away from something. They're trying to run away from war. They're trying to want to run away from persecution. And most people don't want to really leave their countries, but they want peace. They want the right to live, and everyone should be entitled to that. And so Mr. Abdul Kill was concerned that his freedom was going to be interrupted if he were to go back to China. He was working in Pakistan at the time, and while he was working in Pakistan, that's when he was recalled back by the Chinese government. Because he didn't go back to China, he sort of was, he owns a business, he was trying to shut down his business. And so, because it took a little bit longer than the Chinese government wanted it to, he actually got a phone call from his sister. So sister calls him just to check on him to see how he's doing, and she's in China. And she's asking him, when do you think you'll come back to China? And he says, well, I'm trying to shut down my business. I'm trying to be there as soon as I can, but I have to transfer some things, whatnot. And then she says, hold on. She hands the phone, and a, a man co voice comes on the phone, and it's the police. And the police basically tell him, they said, you know, you should probably get here pretty quick because it will be better for your family if you do. He hasn't seen or spoken to his sister since. And so we were rallying for a government to take this man, and thankfully, after sort of weeks, um, excuse me, after hours and hours of rallying, the U.S. government stepped up to the plate and they allowed for him to come to the U.S. on a temporary parole. Um, 
which was really important. And so now he has another battle to fight, which is to try to get asylum. Now, this case, this situation would have never, it wouldn't have turned out this way had it not been for technology, frankly. You know, and I found that it's been a really huge benefit in a lot of ways to the work that I'm able to do, especially with my human rights cases. Also, sort of on the flip side of that, of course, he's even more concerned about the, the well-being of his family that still remains in China. But again, I want to stress that, you know, being detained in re-education re camps in China is illegal. Being detained in immigration camps in Texas is illegal. You know, and it's not just about, you know, protecting a man from China that may be religiously persecuted. By protecting him, we're protecting ourselves. We see cases like this, not just in China, but in our own communities. And we have a duty as citizens to try to do what we can in order to make sure that everyone is protected and everyone has the right to freedom. Now, on Tuesday, I was really concerned about Jade. I hadn't heard from her on Monday. The last text that I got from her was that her saying that she, she said she thinks they suspect something. And so because I didn't know when I was going to receive a text from Jade, what I was doing is I was sleeping with my phone like on my chest. And so at about 2 a.m., my phone started vibrating, and I woke up to a, another text from her. And so she wrote, he raped me. I said, I'm so sorry, Jade. We're close. Just cooperate, OK? OK. Good. So Jade, tell me, what is your favorite thing to eat in Vienna? She wrote, I love McDonald's. Ha ha, the fish mac is the best ever. You will not believe me, but I eat so much, and I'm only 46 kgs. OK, Jade, I have a promise to you. I'll buy you as many fish mac meals in Vienna when we get there. I think they suspect something. We're close. Now, we knew the clock was ticking, and we didn't know where this girl was. We were trying to have her do things like we were having, trying to have her drop pins on Google Maps to try to figure out where she was. That wasn't working. We were trying to have her look out her window to describe sort of the neighborhood. That wasn't working. But we knew that we only had four precious days to really try to figure out where exactly this girl was. Now, part of my practice, it is an international practice. And what I would like to do is I like to litigate within local courts. And I like to litigate the laws within the local jurisdictions to show people how the laws can work for them. To me, litigation is an art. You know, it's my craft. It's not just about having the written law, but about understanding how to argue the nuances of the laws. And frankly, if the laws don't say what I want them to say, then I try to find it. I can always find a law that'll say what, it, what I want it to say, and then it can argue that point. So on Wednesday, I needed to travel to Cochabamba, Bolivia, which is four, more than 14,000 kilometers away from Afghanistan. I didn't want to tell Jade that I was going because I didn't want her to lose her nerve, but I had a trial that was waiting on me that Friday. And so on Wednesday, I wasn't sure, I, again, I didn't want to tell Jade that I was going there. So on Wednesday, I sent Jade a text. And I said to her, I said, is this your door? She said, yes. I said, can you leave today? She wrote, they have someone, someone at the front door at all times. They want to take me to Pakistan. OK, relax. We'll figure it out. There's a car outside, and they'll wait for you as long as they need to, OK? OK, I'm scared. You'll be fine. So I was going to Cochabamba, Bolivia, to go represent a Bolivian doctor who was the first female forensic doctor in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And basically, years back, a man owned a foster care uh, home. And in this foster care home, there were six girls that there are many girls, there are many boys. But there were three girls under the age of six who accused him of sexually assaulting them. The prosecutors got the report, and so they hired the doctor to do an examination of the girls to talk to the girls. And so when she went and talked to the girls, she, they, she agreed that they probably were sexually assaulted, and she testified on their behalf. And the man was eventually found guilty of sexual assault of a child, 
and he was given 15 years in prison. Three years after this court case, they, there was a new prosecutor in town. And basically, he went after my doctor, saying that she gave false testimony in the case involving the girls. Now, it's important to note that none of the victims recanted. None of them changed their stories and said they weren't sexually assaulted. But the reason why the prosecutor was going after my doctor is because there was a psychiatrist, a male psychiatrist that was going around saying that if you're six years of age or under, and if you're raped, you'll die, or you'll be permanently medically damaged. So the fact that none of the girls died or had any permanent medical damage meant that they were lying, and therefore they couldn't have been sexually assaulted. And she was looking at eight years in prison for that. And a lot of my cases have like a wider implication. And so this was a big deal, because it's, it wasn't just about if she was found guilty. But let's just say if she was found guilty, what would that mean for the community? If she was found guilty, then she has to go to prison. But that also means that any kids that were six years of age or under that were sexually assaulted, really, if they didn't die, there's no point in reporting it because now you have this case that says it can't happen. And so one of the arguments that we were going to make in that sort of, um, we made in the community is I said, you know, Pedophiles around the world should take a one trip, a one way ticket to Bolivia because it'll be okay to rape your children. And that is going to be what's going to happen if she's found guilty of this offense. So I was preparing for that trial in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Now, while technology has been a huge benefit to what I do, at, especially with my human rights cases, it can also have, obviously, it, it's, its cons. And so technology has been used to discredit me and some of the work that I do and some of what my clients do. Um, it's been used to uh, try to get, um, or get me, arrested. Um, this happened in Cuba as a result of my being tracked um, with my uh, different accounts and they were able to find me. I went down there to represent a graffiti artist who was being illegally detained, and then I was arrested, and obviously I got out. So, but technology can have its pros and cons, and I have found that in many communities, for instance, like in Malaysia, you know, there's things like the cyber police, and they have whole police departments whose job it is to look on people's social media accounts to make sure that they're not saying th anything that the government doesn't like, and then they try to charge them with sedition. You know, there's places like in China, they look at people's WeChats and see what they're putting in WeChats. These are messages are given back and forth to people, you know, and they're, they're criminally charging people for this stuff. There's people in the U.S. that they don't even realize it, that they're having their emails hacked by the government, and the government is reading it without an arrest warrant or with, without a search warrant and are using those emails against them. So there's pros and cons to technology, but we have found that you know, we try to use it where we can with a lot of work that I do. Now, as part of my job, my sort of superpower, I feel like, it's my job to give people the law, to like, get people to understand that the law is meant to protect them and that the law is for them. And because to me, the law is a very, is a tangible object for me. You know, I, I feel like I feel the law. Like, it's mine. It's my property. Just like I wouldn't want someone to come in and take my shoes, I'm not going to let you come in and take my laws away from me either. And so that's how I try to educate people, not just to, to know what the law says, but to understand what it says. And I try to talk to people about law in a language that they understand. So on Thursday, I sent Layla a text excuse me, Jada text. I knew that the, the clock was ticking and we had only, only a limited amount of time in order to try to rescue her. So 3 a.m. I sent her a text and I said, Jade, is everyone asleep? She said, yes. I said, okay, you need to leave. And she wrote, I can't, someone is downstairs. I said, okay, tomorrow, same time, okay, okay. Now, what I've learned in Afghanistan is just how very, very connected we all are. Do you remember that theory of six degrees of separation? Um, 
I don't know if saying this in Google is, is a bad word, but according to Facebook, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> according to Facebook, they have said that we are now 3.57 degrees of separation from one another, that we're way more connected to each other than we realize. And we need to understand that a problem that happens in Afghanistan is just not a problem that happens in Afghanistan, but that's a problem that we have to deal with too. While they're trying to human traffic Jade, human trafficking is a over, they make over $150 billion a year. It's something that affects all our communities. Displaced people, refugees that are running away from wars, that affects all of us. Forced marriages, you know, women being abused, that's something that affects every community. And we need to wake up and understand that these are not just isolated problems, but these are problems we all have to deal with. Now, as part of sort of what I do, because I want to give the law back to people, and sort of inspired by that first court hearing that I saw in Afghanistan, I've created a comic book called The Disruptors. And basically what The Disruptors is, is a superhero team of lawyers and investigators that travel around the world doing cases. And so for me, this is sort of a pet project. It's a way to educate people about the laws and cultures, but also to entertain. So wherever we go, we're going to make sure that we infuse the laws within those jurisdictions. Also because I was getting so irritated about people not having access to the laws, I created this website called lawsforme.com. And basically what this website is, it's a website where people can have free access to the laws that I put on there. I'm not an IT person, I did the best that I could, so don't judge me on it when you see it. <laughs> but you know, I just wanted people to have access to their laws, so I put it on this website. And the idea is, is that we can hopefully link up the comic book, the laws in the comic book, to the website so people can click on the footnotes and see what the laws are that are available to them. So it's a different way to educate people about the laws. Now, our first edition, we have set it in North Korea. Now, a lot of people, this is like a really, to me, a really cool project. And like when I tell people that are comic book enthusiasts that, you know, we're, we're gonna have the laws in it, they're like, oh, great. You know, but no, we, we do it in a good way. So then this whole, this is a sample copy, but the way that we have the laws in here is we have it like footnoted, so they're end notes, and you can click on that. And so this situation involves a North Korean defector who's trying to leave North Korea. And because we wanted to be sort of uh, next level, we kind of, we also are wanting to create, want to create an app where if you put it over part of the comic book, then it'll come to life. So this scene, I don't know if it'll work, but this is supposed to be, it's not working, this is supposed to be a video, but this video represents this scene in the comic book. Um, because you know you have to educate kids in different ways, and so what we want to do is we want to you know for instance go to um, go to Congo and deal with a child soldier case and infuse laws there. We want to deal with the human trafficking cases. We want to deal with gun cases. We want to deal with all different situations around the world and show people how the laws can and can't work for them. So on Friday I'm in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and I'm in my trial. And so while I'm in my trial, I get a text from my guys that said the coast is about as clear as it's gonna get. And so I'm sitting in trial and you know the prosecutors are questioning my witness. And so I'm sitting there and I'm trying to hide my phone because you know how much judges love it when you're on your phone in trial. And so I'm hiding my phone under the table and I sent Jade a text. And I said, Jade dear, she said yes. I said, it's time. Are you wearing the black clothes like I said? She wrote yes. I said, when you get in the car, we have a burqa and you need to put it on. She wrote okay. I'm scared. I know, get in the car, Jade. 10 minutes passed. And I'm sitting in court and I'm trying to concentrate on the trial that's in front of me and the prosecutors are doing a horrible job questioning my witness, but I'm, I'm just sort of waiting, waiting, waiting and nothing's happening. And so I go, Jade? She said, yes. I said, get in the car. She wrote, I'm scared. I said, do you have your headphones? She wrote, yes. In five minutes, I'll send you a voice note. So I'm sitting in trial and I'm just waiting, waiting, waiting for the minutes to, to roll on and just, it feels like hours. So finally there's a break. And I run to the bathroom and I go in there and I lock the door and I send Jade a voice text, 
a voice note. And in the voice note, I said, Jade, listen to me very carefully. You have five minutes to get in the fucking car. If you don't get in the car, I will never look for you again. I will not look for you in Pakistan. I won't help you anymore. I will never answer your calls. Five minutes. Send. About a minute later, I get another text from her. Miss Motley, please don't leave. And I wrote back, four minutes. And I meant it. Now, since I've been in Afghanistan, I've learned a lot. While I feel like, while I was sent there to capacity build in Afghanistan, I really feel like Afghanistan has capacity build me as a person and as a lawyer. I've learned a lot of things in Afghanistan. I've learned how way more connected we are than we realize. And I've also learned to never judge a burqa by its cover. Because I know now that sometimes under that burqa is a 20-year-old girl from Vienna who just wants to eat a fish mac sandwich. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question for you is, how do you protect yourself and your team? Because all of that was like so harrowing and horrific and terrifying. And what you're doing is so important, but I'm sure there's people who oppose what you're trying to do in these regimes and um, in these like jurisdictions. So yeah, how do you protect yourself and your team? That's a good question. You know, it's, it's difficult. There's no real, like we don't have sort of a, a manual. We sort of work as we go. Um, but we do things like we, we don't tell people, we don't share our movements with people. Um, I don't, all, when I'm in sort of tricky countries, I don't put on social media where I'm at. Um, for my team in particular, you know, we use aliases. You know, we don't tell people where we are. There's people that work for me that have no idea where my office is. You know, that's intentional to protect them and to protect me. Um, and, and sort of we use different people for, you know, people know different things. They don't, everyone doesn't know the whole story. So, like, I'll know the whole story, but I'll, that's a means of protection because, you know, people can be arrested or tortured for information. And so it, it's not an exact science, to be honest, but I can say that for, you know, the 12 years that I've, almost 12 years that I've been doing this, we've never had anyone physically hurt on the team. No one's been arrested other than me, you know, and, and so it's, it's worked out, basically. Um, thank you for the talk, by the way. I guess m my question is, when you're uh, out in different countries and you're going through these cases and you're going through these trials, do you see that your the decisions from these trials are becoming case law, common law, or are you still fighting on a case-by-case -case basis? And if so, what kind of toll does that take on you? Because you're going to go back and do the same thing over and over again. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, for a lot of, like, for instance, Afghanistan and a lot of jurisdictions, they're a civil law system. So it isn't about uh, building case law. You know, although I do try to promote good case law, the problem with for instance, promoting, you know, case law generally in different countries is, for instance, for every one good decision in Afghanistan, there's like 10 horrible decisions. So I don't necessarily want to promote case law, um, but it is, it is pretty much like that where when I have a case and uh, it is case by case, but for those decisions that are good decisions, what I'll try to do in order to educate the public in the best way that I think I can is I will contact, you know, like the local media to make sure that they write on it, they have radio reports on it, you know, that they um, have TV interviews on it because that, that's how it can sort of make it to the people on the ground, which to me, that's what's really important. Um, or I'll go to like the bar associations, I'll talk to the, to the different lawyers and I'll write down, I'll write sort of the decision, I'll share it widely. So that's what I've tried to do you know, in order to share it widely, the good decisions. Because you're right, you know, it, it can be a lot, to like case by case by case by case, but I have found it to be effective, and I have found in certain situations that people will take sort of the blueprints that we set to help sort of represent their clients, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm very grateful that people like you are here, uh, so thanks for that. And the other thing I wanted to ask you is, is there anything that we as non-lawyers can do? For example, I do sometimes share Facebook messages, but I don't feel it's very helpful. <laughs> Is there anything we can do? I don't know, Sunday or, you know, contribute? 
Oh, definitely. I mean, I think there's a lot that you guys can do. Um, I think, like for instance, like for instance in Jade's situation, I think it'd be really cool to really create an app to help fight against human trafficking. And because I've been involved in several cases like this, there's certain things that I would, I know that would be helpful to have in the app where people can maybe share their travel plans. They can have, you know, drop pins, they can put text. It's, it's sort of protected against other people, you know, because I find that especially for like the younger people, they understand the technology. But a lot of times the people that are taking them, they're older and they don't understand the technology. And so they may give that person a phone, not like they had no idea that she was contacting me. They had no idea, you know, what we were doing. Um, and that's why they felt comfortable giving her a phone because they're like, well, if we want to contact, if you know her family members want to contact her, they want a direct line, so it was easy for them. So I think creating apps like that, I think, would be really, really cool. Um, I think one thing that I see that I think would be really helpful is I I see that a lot of problems that people have in the world is because they they're essentially stateless, like they're not allowed to have an identification, you know. And for a lot of countries, like for instance, Afghanistan, just think about everything you do with our identification. You can work, you can go to school, you can travel. So I would love it to partner on trying to figure out how we can get women and girls their identity back, you know, and give them identification. Because in a lot of countries like Afghanistan, in order to get it, you need to have a man's permission. And so a lot of times the men will never give permission. It's not legal that they need the men's permission, but that's culturally what's been accepted. So frankly, what my plan has be, been is, why don't we try to get women in prison their identification cards? And the reason why I think prison is the right way to go to start is because essentially the women that are in prison, the government can't say they don't know who they are, right? Because that's the whole argument. We need a man to identify this woman because we don't know who she is. Well, if you're in prison, then the government's supposed to know who you are. And if they say they don't, know, they, they don't know who they are, then I'm going to unleash a whole platoon of lawyers to get those ladies out. So then you'll win that argument. And then you get those ladies their ID then you roll it out to the women's shelters. Same argument. There, you know, the women's shelters, by and large, the government puts them there. And then once you get the women in their shelters, their ID, then you roll it out to the general population. And then the argument becomes, oh, woman in prison get her ID, but I can't. And essentially, and you'll win that argument, right? And essentially what you'll do is you will inevitably have more women going to school, more women working, more women, and then also creating it as an electronic ID too, I think is very important because you get things, situations like Jay's, where they tear it up and they destroy it. So we need to create sort of identification so people that are trafficked or just general public, it cannot be destroyed. That makes sense. Thank you so much. This is so, so impressive and I think really brave work. What I like when you said that it's practicing the law for you is like an art and you go to so many different countries and then you try to understand the local culture, the local customs, but obviously lost in translation can be a problem as well. So I was wondering how you, like what are you doing about that specific problem? Well, I mean, in terms of wherever I go, if, if the English is not the primary language, then I'll hire translators that are work with me. And for me personally, I have found the best translators <laughs> to be those translators that went to school with English as their major. That's the translators I choose to choose. Some people, they want like lawyers, but then I find that they try to be lawyers, you know, and I'm like, no, I just need you to translate what I say. But I do try a lot to collaborate with local attorneys because it's a good way for me to be taught and it's a good way for me to teach, you know, because it is a group effort wherever I'm at to represent people. Yeah, so we were just wondering, for Jade's uh, case, how, how did you manage to get, out, get her out of the country, one, and also how did you locate the house? So Jade was, even though she was in this room and it was a family house, there were her cousins were coming in to visit, you know, her kid cousins. So we advised her that when your cousins come in, you know, when they go outside, ask them what do they see. So they would go out and play and they would say, you know, oh, there's this school or this. And so she was doing that for a number of days and that's how we tracked it down. Now Jade's, Jade's case was a little bit tricky because I, you know, I'm not a cowboy, I'm an attorney. And we try to do things very safely. What made it even trickier in Afghanistan because we were thinking, okay, should we get the police involved or shouldn't we? The problem, which ultimately we decided that 
we should not get them involved. And the reason being is because even though it's illegal, a lot of ladies have gone to prison for running away. And so it very well could have happened that if we got the police involved, that they would have definitely made sure that she stayed in the house. And so um, ultimately we decided that it wasn't a good idea. So, th and those were actual text messages. So once Jade came into the car, because I really did have to yell at her because it wasn't just about her physical confinement anymore. She was being psychologically confined, you know, and I knew she had to get over that hump. And we had people outside the house that we knew, because we were counting, right? How many adults are in the house, how many kids? So we knew, based on people that were coming out of the house, that there was like two adults in the house. And so what she did is she played a game of hide and seek and she told the kids, okay, because it's like, she was like on the fourth floor. So she was like, okay, let's hide. And she was telling the kids, you know, close all the doors to the stairs and then we're gonna hide. And so that's how she ran out the house. And so we did put a burger on it, on her. And then I did have her in a house that, you know, no one knows um, with my people. And then um, days later, I was after this trial, um, I was back in Afghanistan. And then I was working with the Vienna government in Pakistan because they don't have an embassy in Afghanistan, got a visa. And then I took her to Vienna. Thanks so much for your work and your talk. Um, I'm wondering, in a lot of countries, it seems like there's structural circumstances that just prevent a fair trial in the first place, like a biased judge, for example. I'm just wondering, does it feel like you're running up against a wall in the, those kind of trials, or how do you cope with that? When I fight a case, I fight it from a legal standpoint, and I cite the local law. So I don't come in and, like, for instance, if I'm representing a woman that was raped and she's being charged with adultery, I don't come in and say, well, it's immoral that, you know, I fight, I use the law to fight the cases. And I have found that to be really, really effective, which it seems like it's no brainer, really effective when talking to judges and talking to prosecutors. And because often, especially like, like Afghanistan, um, they'll do things like have hundreds of people that go to court without an attorney. But no one has brought up the fact that according to the law, they're supposed to have an attorney. You know what I mean? And so that's where the art artistry comes in. It's how you talk to people and how you sort of, you know, uh, art, make those arguments without being insulting and without being a know-it-all, if that makes sense. Um, so those are things we were able to do. And we've been able to have conversations with judges and we're also willing to learn from judges. And so, you know, again, that's where it's, it's a case by case basis, but especially when it involves women, it's a little bit more tricky. But what I found to be effective too is, you know, trying to get the judges to put themselves in the shoes of the person or say, well, what if this was your daughter? Or, you know, let's just say it's not Jade. Let's just say it's your daughter, you know? So what would you want us to do? What do you think would be the best way to go forward with this? So that's what's been effective. Because at the end of the day, you're dealing with humans. Right. And by and large, I believe humans are, are good, you know, and I have found a lot of humans, really cool, cool humans that you wouldn't think would be on the same side that do come around. Again, like everybody, you know, I just want to thank you for coming and sharing with us your story, which is very inspiring. Um, and my question is related to what you said. I'm just thinking about resistance because you go to a place like that and you are a woman, you are American. So it's a different culture and you're working with this man to help these women, how do you make them listen to you? Because I'm sure for some of them, they would be thinking, yes, you have a voice, but your voice is not the same as if it was coming from another man from this culture. Uh, so how did you overcome that? Not just in Afghanistan, but in Bolivia or any other country for that matter. Well, I mean, I mean there, I've heard um, the saying that there's a reason why you have two ears and one mouth, because you're <laughs> supposed to listen twice as much as you talk. So a lot of it involves me listening to what is being said. Um, that's really, really important. Frankly, I've also found that being a foreign woman has been a real asset in a lot of countries, especially in Afghanistan. And I think it's been in, an asset because um, if I were a foreign man, for instance, I represent Afghan women, Afghan men, you know, foreign men, foreign women, whatever. If I were a foreign man, there's no way they would let me represent an Afghan woman, you know. Um, but I can represent an Afghan man and it's not a problem. So I feel like I get to see everything. And this is the case with many cultures. 
And I find that, especially in cultures where it's very misogynistic, um, I sort of do things that are considered what a man would do. You know, like for instance, I look men in the eye, I shake hands, um, I choose to dress the way that I choose to dress. Um, I don't ask for permission to, you know, wear something or don't wear something. That's helpful. And I think, generally speaking, um, especially like in countries that are very male dominated, because it's so weird what I'm doing and who I am, I think they're just curious. People are just are curious. And so that's why. I'm sort of allowed to be in these spaces, if that makes sense. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a wonderful talk. Um, how do you, to what extent have you been successful in um, um, distributing, uh, disseminating your method of advocacy in Afghanistan? You use we quite often. Um, obviously, your uh, effectiveness in the long term must depend hugely on how many people you convert indigenously. How is that, how is that progressing? Well, you know, I've been in Afghanistan since 2008, and I've won every case. Like, I've been spoiled. I've won every case. I've gotten every person that has been my client out of prison. I've, you know, I've won every case. I'll tell you what's hard for me, though. What's hard for me is, and that's great, right, to win cases. But what's been difficult is I can win a case. Like, I can get a girl off for being a rape victim. That's easy now, you know. But what's difficult is her going back home and her being pressured by her family members to still marry the person. And so that has been a struggle for me, but I have to be realistic about what I can do. You know, I'm people's lawyers. I'm not their life coach, unfortunately. And, you know, I try to set realistic expectations for myself. They're definitely, I don't know if they're necessarily following my lead, but there definitely are a lot more lawyers in Afghanistan sort of being more provocative advocates which is that are friends of mine that that's great and I, I don't want to take the credit that's because of me you know but I can say for instance um, there's when I first came to Afghanistan in 2008 I was trying to convince lawyers to go to court like to go to court to represent your clients a couple months ago I gave a, and I sort of do these informal trainings, and part of my informal training is I tell people, bring your cases, and let's talk about, let's, let's try to talk about what your strategy, let's do strategic litigation, let's set this up. A couple months ago, I did a training there on DNA evidence, which is amazing, and, and all the, it was like to 10 attorneys, and nine of them were women. That's amazing to me, you know, and they're just real, and that, wouldn't, that was unheard of in 2008. I, I had to convince people to go to court, you know, I was having arguments with people, you have to go to court. And so I do see a lot of really positive progress with other attorneys that are advocating for people, that are showing up to court. Um, but frankly, I mean, it still has a long way to go, but you have to start somewhere. I have, as a result of some of my cases where I've represented victims, where no one's representing victims, now we see other attorneys going to court representing victims. So I do see things have sort of progressed uh, positively in a lot of ways within the legal system, which is good. Uh, we're very, very uh, thankful for you to come out here and speak to us about the amazing work you're doing. So uh, we'd like to give you another round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you.